Hi. For those who don't know, my name is Jillian Graham. Again, thank you so much for coming to this very exciting webinar this afternoon. First, I'd like to acknowledge that currently I'm on the unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have been stewards of the land for time and memoriam and are constantly on the, the front lines of this climate fight, uh, yet they're the ones that are most at risk for climate collapse. And myself as a white settler, am not the owner of this land. However, I do have a connection and I do have the necessity and the responsibility to protect this stolen land from decimation. So this might be the first call for some of you. Uh, I know others have also been to previous calls, but welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here. Like Laura said, this is being recorded for the purpose of those who can't be here this evening and only the speakers will be seen. We have quite a few people on this call, so guests are automatically on mute. This is simply because we're super conscious of time and we need to stick to around an hour and a half. Uh, so there will be a chance to unmute later once we go into breakout rooms. The agenda of this webinar is, I'll start by giving a brief introduction of what Last Generation Canada is, uh, an introduction of myself and who I am, and our esteemed guests, David Suzuki and Adam McKay. David Suzuki and Adam McKay will be speaking to us about the pressing realities of the upcoming fire season and the severity of this climate crisis that's barreling towards us. Um, what they do to take action and advice on how you should take action too. We will also have Laura Sullivan from Last Generation talk a little bit about her story into civil resistance and how Last Generation Canada plans to win. I'll explain what action pathways you can take following the meeting and we'll have a short breakout so we can speak and share our stories together. And this is the first of two meetings. It's really just an introduction to our esteemed guest speakers and our follow-up meeting next Thursday, which I will give the link to later, uh, talks a little bit more about how you can take action. So my name is Jillian and I am speaking to you in Ottawa. We are all at different times in our geographical location from BC to Nova Scotia, but in our heads and in our hearts, uh, we're all the same. And right now we're at a time for action is needed in the greatest threat that humanity has ever faced. And although this isn't just to talk about the science of climate collapse, it's worth a quick look at the alarming evidence of climate breakdown that we're facing in Canada. Right now in April, there are over 150 fires still ongoing from last year's catastrophic fire season. 70% of Canada is facing drought-like conditions and climate scientists are warning us that this summer is going to be even worse than last year. And last year, we had the worst air quality in the world. Climate change was knocking at all of our doors. 240,000 people were displaced. Climate crisis is, it's happening now and you're, you all know that. That's why you're on this call today. It's completely terrifying and overwhelming, but now is not the time to go into despair. It's the time to turn our knowledge and hope into action. So a brief introduction about myself. Uh, in short, I have always remembered being concerned about the climate. And as my mom who is here today knows that I began transgressing social norms at a very young age. So when I was 15, I became head of the environmental club in high school, and I ordered a liberal sign to my conservative parents' house because I wanted to live, I wanted to believe in Trudeau's vision for change. Um, after that, I became vegetarian at 17 years old, despite living on a beef farm for my entire life. All the while, signing petitions, going to marches and demonstrations. I knew that this wasn't enough, but I thought it was good enough. Um, the moment I looked up and realized it wasn't good enough was last summer. I was tree planting in Northern British Columbia and 
getting sunburnt in May in a place that usually is deep down into the negative really woke me up. And for the next three months, my colleagues and I were working in harsh conditions with dozens of forest fires raging around us, always packing our bags, ready to evacuate when the fires inevitably grew. And that summer, we saw countless climate refugees in Northern Alberta fighting for the last motel room when their homes were burning down. And I saw children unable to go anywhere except for the parking, the parking lot uh, outside of their motel. And I knew I had to take action. I thought last summer would be a wake up call to the rest of Canada, you know, five times worse than our national average. Uh, and I thought it would be a wake up call to our politicians, but here we are today in 2024, looking at another catastrophic summer in the eyes while the Ontario government has cut our wildland bu budget by $100 million in the past two years. And other provinces like Alberta are following suit. So I turned to Last Generation, a nonviolent civil resistance campaign, because it was the only option in this collapsing world. And last August, during Last Generation's action phase, I witnessed brave, ordinary people getting on the roads and demanding a national firefighting agency that trains and employs 50,000 people year round. I saw three people in a road blocking it and they had more media coverage than the climate strike I attended, which had over 5,000 people. And with this, I refuse and I refuse to step down, uh, but we need more of you to step up and we have a plan. Last Generation Canada, one of the many civil resistance campaigns throughout the world is demanding a national firefighting agency. And this is a no brainer when we're looking towards climate collapse. Um, thank you so much. I would like to move on to our amazing speakers. First, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to David Suzuki who has been an activist on all of our TV screens for the past 44 years, where he was hosting The Nature of Things. Um, so David, you've been sounding the alarm on the climate crisis for decades. Your radio series, It's a Matter of Survival, aired in 1989. It's 2024, and we're sitting at 1.5 degrees of temperature rise. Uh, I would love if you could share some reflections on these years of advocacy for us. You're muted, David. You, I said, how many hours do you have for me to respond? <laughs> Let me say at the beginning that uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, Vancouver, from the traditional ancestral territory, the uh, stolen lands of the uh, Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and uh, Squamish nations. And um, they've got a great deal to teach us, it seems to me, about uh, what sustainability is all about. I'm also, I want to say I'm honored to be here with Adam, you know, who uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, that that really important film ended the way we seem to... Uh, continue to be at, ignoring this important issue. I, I began my uh, career in environmental advocacy, advocacy in 1962, uh, when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, all about the unexpected effects of uh, pesticides. And at that time, uh, I got involved. I thought, humans are taking too much stuff out of the environment and putting too much junk waste back into it. So we've got to regulate how much and what we put into it and and uh, enforce those regulations. But now I, I realized that uh, we don't know enough to even anticipate. You know, when DDT was invented uh, or found to be uh, an insecticide, Paul Mueller won a Nobel Prize for that in 1948. And it was only much later that we discovered that 
my God, you spray DDT all over the place. And guess what? Birds, birds begin to disappear because of my biomagnification and DDT gets concentrated in the breast milk of women. We didn't know about biomagnification. So how can we regulate these new uh, uh, technologies uh, that are coming online? It really was when uh, I prepared for a, a film on uh, the fight over, um, over logging in the Queen Charlotte Islands that are now called Haida Gwaii, that I came to see that our problem is the way we are relating to the rest of nature on the planet. We act as if we're at the top dog and we're, we're at the top and everything around is for us. And environmentalists are simply running around saying, oh, you got to be more careful. We got to take care of, uh, uh, of the environment. I uh, interviewed an Haida activist who was, uh, had fought the logging on his island for years. And I said, Guja, uh, you're, you have a high level of unemployment about the high, uh, in the Haida Gwaii, and a lot of the loggers are Haida. Why are you opposed to cutting down these trees? You know, you're an artist. Uh, what happens when the trees are gone? And his answer was, yes, we'll still be here when the trees are gone. But then, I guess we'll just be like everybody else. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about until I reflected on it. And he was telling me that to be Haida meant being connected to the air, the water, the fish, the trees. All of that is what make the Haida who they are. You cut out the trees or you eliminate the fish or the birds and you're no longer who you are. And that led me then to a total change in the way I saw the environmental problem. It's the environmental problem is a human problem that we have, we see ourselves extricated from the natural world and that we're so important, what we do comes before everything else. Canada had 10 years of a prime minister who said, we can't act, do anything about climate change. That's crazy economics. Stephen Harper wouldn't even acknowledge the reality of a climate change as a threat because all he saw was the economy was the most important thing. And that's still going on right now when you look at the arguments. I had a discussion with uh, a member of parliament right now, a liberal who's been supporting me for years. He's an environmentalist. And I went up to him at a, an event. I said, listen, you guys are in charge. You've got to declare an emergency. Stop all money being invested in the fossil fuel industry and start putting it where it really needs to be uh, acted on. And he said, oh, if we do that, Polyev will get in. So I said, so you're telling me that your government is not doing what has to be done now because of the next election. And he said, that's the way it is. And that's the way it's been. My organization led the Blue Dot uh, campaign to try to get the right to a healthy environment enshrined in our constitution. Seven years later, it's finally uh, been mandated, not in the Constitution, but it is now a government uh, act that we have to pay attention to. Because every time the uh, government in charge at the time said, oh, yeah, we want to do that, but we can't do it till the next election. And they keep using the election as the excuse for not doing uh, the right thing. Over and over again, the problem is that we've created legal structures, economic uh, entities, and and uh, um, the and uh, um, political systems that are meant to guide and and uh, constrain human beings. They're all about the way we interact with each other. But we left nature out. You know the the legal. Um, uh, animals and plants don't give a damn about our legal entities, our boundaries, or our legal our laws. They act as if they have the right to exist just because they've always been here, and they do. Um, our political constraints, of course, are all based on people in Canada, people who vote. Well, guess what? Children don't vote, or future generations don't vote. Uh, 
it's not and politicians are guided by the political game that they're in for that matter trees don't vote fish don't vote oceans don't vote the minister of fisheries and oceans doesn't care about fish and oceans i mean she cares about people who are going to vote for her those are people that want to use fish and oceans minister of forests his job isn't to protect the trees it's to look after the forest industry and the people that want to use for it. so We've elevated ourselves so we think everything is about us. What I learned from the Haida is a much different way of seeing our place on the planet. That indigenous people see that we are utterly dependent on nature for our health and well-being. And that's why, you know, I've been to so many uh, ceremonies. I just came back from a potlatch this uh, weekend, and they're constantly, indigenous people are constantly thanking their creator for nature's generosity and abundance and acknowledging a reciprocal responsibility to act in a good way to ensure that nature continues. And that's what we've lost now. And you hear it big time. You know, right now, uh, we're going through a discussion about the truckers uh, uh, block in Ottawa a few years ago. Trudeau's going to testify today. All of this stuff, if you listen to those truckers, it's about freedom, 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 as if there's no responsibility. The reciprocity that Indigenous people have is absolutely crucial to our survival, a recognition that we are utterly dependent on nature and incorporate that. And that's what I've, I've learned in the years since, in the 40 odd years since I and my family have embraced indigenous uh, uh, activism and activists because they are providing the relationship with uh, the world that we desperately need to to recover. It's the way people thought for 99% of human existence. We saw that we were one strand in a web of relationships with all other species of plants and animals, with the air, the water, the soil, and the sunlight. That's the way humans understood. But now we think that we're so important that we've puffed ourselves up and we're in charge. We're remaking the planet to serve us. And uh, we're too ignorant to do this in a way uh, we don't have enough respect. I'm sorry, I've gone off on a rant. I've even forgotten what your uh, question was. No, no, that was beautiful. And that kind of leads me until my next question because it's very clear that we've lost the relationship with the land. And um, with this extraction-based regime that we're facing right now, some people might not know the link between fossil fuels and forest fires. Um, and a lot of the people in this call probably live on the East Coast and haven't even dealt with forest fires. So I wanted to know a little bit about that. And as a longtime resident of British Columbia, what changes have you seen over the last decade or a couple of decades uh, with the forest fires as our global temperatures continue to rise? Look, any, anybody who doesn't realize this is happening is not going to be tuned into this webinar. Let's face it. If you don't look outside and see what the hell's going on, then uh, I just don't think our telling them now is uh, they're not even going to be interested in that. So, And it's not just climate change. I mean, I, I'm uh, going to be on a program tomorrow with, uh, with Johan Rockström. I don't know if you know Johan. He's, um, uh, I think he's a Norwegian, but he's at the Potsdam Institute in Germany. And uh, Johan's group for years now has been trying to define the planetary boundaries, the things that should limit us as a biological creature to keep us healthy and that should we should stay within those boundaries dictated by the atmosphere, the oceans, you know, the pH of the oceans, the carbon in the atmosphere, the nitrogen cycle that we're affecting by artificial fertilizers. He has defined nine planetary boundaries beyond which humans, as one species among 10 to 30,000 uh, million species, we should be staying within those planetary boundaries. We've passed six of them already. You know, climate is just one of them. So we have dug a big hole. I, I, 
You know, I used to say uh, hum humanity at the edge. I now say humanity over the edge. We've gone over the edge of the cliff. The question is, how far are we going to drop? And uh, we've passed six of the nine planetary boundaries. It's unimaginable to me that the vast majority of people don't even know about Rockstrom's work. You know, and uh, what's what's going on? We're we're obsessed with with the economy. The economy has, you know, look a major a major uh, contestant for the for the presidency of the United States calls climate change a hoax, just as he called COVID uh, a, a hoax. Like, what the hell is going on? Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, when he got in, in 2015, he went to Paris a few months after he was elected, came back from Paris and said, yes, we signed Paris and we're going to limit uh, climate to uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels by the year 2000. And we all cheered. I emailed him and said, this is a hard target. Are you going to, are you serious? And he emailed me back and said, I'm very serious. This is something. So we all celebrated and said how great a day it was. Two years later, he bought a pipeline. He bought a pipeline for $4.2 billion that Enbridge wouldn't even invest in, the pipeline uh, maker that they wouldn't even invest in, and Canadians then in, had $4.2 billion invested. Well, guess what? It's already $32 billion and counting. Where the hell is this guy that's saying, ax the tax? If he cares about the economy, where the hell is Polyev in terms of this overspending on a stupid thing that Antonio Guterres, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, called economic and moral madness, this investment in fossil fuel infrastructure. So if Polyev cares about the economy, where the hell is he about what we've just invested? $32 billion, and it still hasn't carried any oil from Alberta, and it will never if we're going to deal with the climate change issue seriously. Again, I forgot what the hell you asked me. No, you are speaking to the choir. Thank you so much. Um, and it's very clear that our government doesn't care about us and is continuing to invest in extraction-based regime that is killing us. And it's sad, but your daughter, Severin, when I can't remember how old she was, but those well, speeches she made, 12, as a kid and people like Greta have had to be vocal advocates for environmental actions in childhood. So it's unfortunate that children have to step up to the plate because our politicians are doing nothing. But how do you see the role of youth activism in driving change? And what, what advice would you give to climate activists? Greta, uh, well, Severn, when she spoke in 1992, had an impact. And, uh, you know, as she got a year or two older, she said, gosh, I didn't realize how complex the world is. You know, she got into the world where the economy and all that other stuff. As a child, she saw the world in a very simple way. Uh, Greta came along and had an impact greater than all of the other environmentalists put together. Uh, it was huge. And what an amazing thing I I like to think she stands on the shoulders of all the environmentalists but that went before, but there's just no question. The impact uh, was the purity of her message, the simplicity of the message. And, uh, you know, she said, listen, we're taught in school to take science seriously. And what the science is, is that if we carry on the way we're going, we don't have a future. Now, damn it all, if adults aren't going to listen to that, then what the hell are they going to listen to? I think the uh, the alliance, you know, I, I like to say, I, I just had my 88th birthday uh, last month, and, uh, and I like to think that uh, this is the most important time in my life. Because why? I don't have to kiss anybody's ass in order to get a job, a raise, or a promotion. 
I speak on behalf of my children. I don't speak, and grandchildren. I don't speak on behalf of any organization or corporation. And and I can, I'm no longer driven by, uh, you know, lust or uh, or a drive for money or fame or or uh, um, or power. I can now speak the truth from my heart. And if that offends people, that's their problem, not mine. You know, retired admirals and generals against nuclear war during the peace movement, they had an incredible impact. And, you know, they went through their careers saying, we need nuclear deterrence, we need this activism, in, or the, these machines in order to counter the, the Soviets and all that. When they retired, they could say, this is crazy. This is not making us any safer. They could tell the truth. So what I see now is for heaven's sake, get the children to speak the purity of the message. But we need the elders in there who to, to back them up with, with their experience and their knowledge. And I've been calling for the elders from the fossil fuel industry, the forest industry, the fishing industry, the mining industry. You guys have your, your pensions now. You've made your money. Now, damn it all, tell us the truth. We need the elders out there to tell the truth, but we need, and, and their experience, but we need children there to remind us what the hell it's all about. When Trudeau signed for that, that uh, um, pipeline, I emailed him immediately and said, what the hell are you doing? I said, you have young children. What you have done is made a decision that will reverberate throughout the lives of your children. What the hell are you doing? And you know what his response was? He doesn't respond to my emails anymore. That's the way of dealing with it. Children have got to be everything, but you've got to galvanize the adults who have all the power and the money. You've got to get, you start with mom and dad. You know, when, when we began the, the David Suzuki Foundation in 1992, or 1990, and, um, uh, you know, uh, people came to me and they said, uh, we got to get on with the children. We got to educate the children. And I said, no, World Watch Institute says the 1990s have got to be the turnaround decade. If we don't turn things around in 10 years, we're going to be toast. And so I said, every dollar we spend, we got to spend it on our campaigns. But I realized very quickly that when you, when someone's gone to university, they finally get a good job, they get married, they buy a house, they have kids, and environmentalists come along and say, oh, sorry, you can't do that anymore. You got They get mad because they've invested a lot of time and effort to get to where they are. And so I understand that. I'd get mad too. But uh, if they have children and children say, mom, dad, I'm worried. I mean, they teach us in school that my future is in doubt. If mom and dad aren't willing then to say, holy cow, we got to do it differently, then what the hell? You know, do we even deserve to survive as a species if that's it? Exactly. You answered uh, one of my questions about giving elders advice, but it's so clear. You Even you, one of the most influential people uh, about the environment in Canada, are getting nothing in response from the government. Uh, so obviously, ordinary people who sign petitions and go on marches are getting nothing either. And people are giving their time, their money, their complete energy just to have a livable future. Um, do you think that direct action might be our last chance at survival? I uh, I don't know about the last chance for survival. Uh, let me just state that this, uh, a lot of people say, well, the, the planet's in trouble, the Earth's in trouble, and the Earth isn't in trouble. The, 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 we are eliminating thousands of species every year. The biosphere is changing, and we have become so powerful, we are actually influencing the biophysical uh, properties of the planet on a geological scale. There's never been a species as powerful as we are. We are changing uh, the planet, and 
but the earth is going along doing what it always did uh and you know we've induced a major extinction uh, episode uh, the planet will recover, but the chances are very high that we won't be there as it begins its recovery. And recovery is going to take, if we look at the past mech big extinction uh, episodes, it will take about eight to 10 million years before life recovers. So re just remember, we've been around for 150,000 <laughs> years, not very long, and we've uh, changed it enormously. Sybil, I, I, I've come to where I am ready now. For years, I've been blackmailed by the nature of things. Um, I was ready to go with the Haida after I uh, did my show on the uh, confrontation over Windy Bay. I said I was going to get arrested. And the nature of things said, look, if you get arrested, the chances are they'll, they'll pull you off the air, but they'll probably cancel our series. And I couldn't do, because I think the nature of things has been an absolutely important uh, program uh, for Canadians. I'm very proud of that. The record of, that had nothing to do with me. I mean, it's a series uh, that's been very good. So fortunately, my father said, my father was in his 60s then. He said, well, David, I've got your name. I'll go up and get arrested in your place. So he did. But uh, um, uh you know, I think civil disobedience, we're long past a time when civil disobedience was something that we should consider for the future. No, I think we're ready for that. And you see the Wet'suwet'en people up there fighting and a lot of non-Indigenous people are are supporting them and, and joining them in, in, in that battle at Ferry Creek. Uh, here on, Van on Vancouver Island, uh, kids have been arrested uh, in large numbers. And I think that's that's got to have more and more. But I want to tell you, we live in what's called a democracy. And we have a good example of what can be done. Uh, two years ago, Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, who is no environmentalist, declared that the Green Belt, which was one of our great successes as environmentalists, to get an, a whole area around the city of Toronto, Canada's biggest city, designated as a Green Belt, where there would be no development. Doug Ford comes in a year or two after he's elected. He opens the green belt up and begins to issue permits to go in and develop the green belt. Well, you saw the reaction in Ontario. One year later, Doug Ford crawled on his belly and not only apologized to Ontarians, but he took back what he did. He declared that it is, again, protected and rescinded the permits that he gave. And that's possible when people get up and they get angry in large numbers. So this is what I'm I think there are two things that people can do. People are constantly coming up saying, I'm a drop in the bucket. What difference does it make what I do? Just remember, you can fill any bucket if there are enough drops. But I think each of us, we're a part of the system. What can we do? The two things that I think we can do in a, uh, and have an immediate impact. We've got to become politically active. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're old enough to vote. You can write, email, call politicians in any party and just say, I am concerned that this is an issue that you've got to have as the highest priority. And you do that not just once. You don't just vote. You do that every week, you, and encourage as many other people as you know to do the same thing. That's called political pressure. And believe me, it can have an effect if it's big enough and sustained enough. So that's one thing that we've got to do. The second thing I think is we're caught up in a web of the way that we're living is fueling the economy through consumption. So I challenge people, I say, look, you know, reduce your consumption by 50%. And right now I think people are beginning to think seriously about how they spend their money as the cost of housing and food begins to skyrocket. People, you know, when you go to Walmart or Home Depot and look at all the stuff Stuff. Like, what the? Why do we have to buy any of that? You know, it's not. My parents always taught me you have to work hard for the necessities in life, but we're working hard for the wants in life. Oh, I want this. I want that. I want, but how much of that would you consider necessity? Let me end this little rant by saying 
after World War II ended, we had, my family and I had been incarcerated for three years during the war. And then BC kicked us out of the province and uh, we ended up in Ontario. We were impoverished. We had nothing. And clothing was a big expense in our, in our budget. So that's why all my life I have worn blue jeans. Why? Because denim wears like iron. When I see kids paying hundreds of dollars for brand new blue jeans already ripped to shreds, I say that is a statement about us as a species. It says, I just want to look good. I mean, you got to be demented to think that looks good. But anyway, I want to look good. And when I'm done with this, it's going straight into the garbage. I mean, that's a statement about what we are as a species, it seems to me. We ought to get our act together and wonder you know, how much of this stuff that we're buying all the time do we really need? And let's get on with uh, being a much more local animal where we do all our socializing and and with with our family and with our local community and, and we become much more self-sufficient. And those are the big challenges that face us, not just consumption. Thank you so much. Uh, it's inspiring, I think, hopefully... What we get from you isn't despair, but inspiration, because we are slowly by slowly changing uh, society. And thank you so much, David, not only for taking part in this call and speaking to us, but also for dedicating and spending your life speaking out about what's happening in Canada and being the voice that we have all long looked up to. And your words of recognizing what needs to be done is incredibly powerful and it means so much for people we look up to that are influential to support direct action and direct change because right now ordinary people are for, uh, fighting on the front lines and need all the support we can get um, again thank you so much I wish we had more time to speak with you but now we are going to be passing it off to Director Adam McKay, who is uh, a winning film director, screenwriter, and comedian. His movie, Don't Look Up, parodied the ridiculous situation we currently find ourselves in and the portrayal of how media and politicians responded to the comment in the film is unfortunately an accurate portrayal of how they respond to the climate crisis in real life, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, lots of people in this call, myself included, can identify with the characters in the film and how they deal with the backlash from the media, the public, and the law when they're just sounding the alarm on the truth. So welcome, Adam, and thank you. Um, I would love if you could tell us a little bit more about the inspiration behind Don't Look Up. Yeah, so we'll First off, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, David, you are awesome. You're all incredible, everyone on this call. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I always tell people there was a movie I worked on that really changed my worldview. And they always say, oh, the big short or don't look up. And I say, no, Ant-Man. And they're like, what? And I, the experience I had doing a draft of that script, I'm just a writer on it. Uh, part of what I had to know about, even though I, when I was a little kid, I loved comics was I had to know all about ants because we were looking for story turns and, you know, part of Ant-Man is, is that he, you know, interacts with ants as ridiculous as this sounds. And I learned that ants, the way they, most of them, the way they eat and propagate is they lay out, they send the ants everywhere and they lay out scent trails. So depending on what food the, you know, 
thousand ants discover if they find a, a crumb or a dead cricket, they lay out a scent trail that all the other ants then follow. And then all the ants show up and they eat the dead cricket. And for some reason, after we released the Big Short Vice, which was about the Iraq war and Don't Look Up, which is obviously about our ignoring climate, I kept coming back to that awareness that, you know, no one purposely wants to do the wrong thing. Everyone goes to sleep at night thinking they're okay, uh, whether it's Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Trudeau, the oil company CEOs, everyone has a narrative they tell themselves about why they're okay and why they're a grown up and that freaked out mob doesn't understand what's going on. And then when we made Don't Look Up, the response was really interesting. I mean, you really, when you make films or make anything, uh, it could be a painting, a, a sculpture, you really learn a lot based on the reaction. And Don't Look Up was really interesting because the way it played in the world for people was incredible. Uh, you know, Netflix was sending us all the data and it was like 11 to one positive on social media. But, uh, and you know, there were protests that resulted, it, it couldn't have been more affirming for me, someone who was freaked out about what's happening with the climate to see that popular response. But on the flip side, the professional classes or the money liberals or whatever you want to call them hated the movie. And I'm a big believer in you have to understand the dynamic you're in, in order to undo it. And that experience of making Don't Look Up taught me so much about the scent trails uh, that, that people in charge are currently focused on. And I really, and, I, and I'm, I'm a, you know, people who know me, I'm a deep dive kind of guy. When I'm concerned about something, I learn everything I can. So with climate, you know, I got to be friends with all the scientists, the activists. This is like years ago, not as long as David, who saw it earlier than I did, but this is going back like seven, eight years. And I started to really see after Don't Look Up, how it's all about incentives warping worldview. And that may seem obvious to a lot of you, but I think it's worthwhile to kind of like say it out loud because when you really look at it that way and you look at, yeah, Donald Trump says it's a hoax, but Joe Biden has increased drilling more than any leader we've ever had. And like David said about Trudeau, he wants to be the good guy, uh, but when it comes to actually doing things or taking a risk, he won't. And that really goes back to scent trails. It really goes back to incentives. And the way that bridges to the turn I've taken in my life is that I realized until you break that scent trail, uh, that incentive, nothing will change. And when you get to the end of that thought, it is active, loud, disruptive protest.
And I've really gotten to the point where I can't see any other way to deal with this very real crisis that we're in right now. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw, but a couple of days ago, the temperature out of nowhere shot up 38 degrees in the Antarctic. It was the highest single temperature increase or decrease ever recorded. And just today, Zeke Housefather from Berkeley Earth, who is traditionally a very moderate, some would even say kind of white liberal kind of guy, said 1.5 is done, 1.5 Celsius warming above pre-industrial as for all intense purposes, analysis been crossed. And in his post, he said, we have to stop to see. Man, I mean, you get into 2C, we don't know if we can get through that. I mean, you know, we, we were talking earlier about uh, the gentleman from the Potsdam Institute, Romsdorf. He's actually said, and so has James Hansen, that 1.2 degrees Celsius warming was the threshold for creating tipping points. So you look at the urgency, you look at the threat, you look where we're at, we all try and shut out all the white noise, the sales pitches, the you know misinformation that has gotten so advanced. And you try not to bite the hook on those little scent trails that go nowhere, which are like, you know, lets me be outraged that that guy doesn't believe in climate. Well, the people not believing in climate are actually not the problem. It's people like Trudeau and Biden who say they believe and then do the opposite. So you take in the kind of situational awareness of the moment, which I've really thought long and hard about, and the only answer I, I just don't see any other answer is civil disruption, major civil disruption. I work a lot with climate defiance who are fantastic. And what I love about them is they don't just interrupt oil CEOs or extreme right wingers. They go after the uh money bourgeoisie class. They go after Democrats. They go after the people that pay lip service. And there's incredible videos of them really taking these people to task. And you can see on their faces, they never, no one's ever challenged them. They're so used to being the good guy against that boogeyman that is the extreme right, we got to just go towards the scent trail, the ants going towards the crumb, because we know what that is. That's money. That's campaign dollars. That's getting reelected. That is professional admiration. That is stability. And it must be broken by any means necessary. And I'm aware I'm quoting Malcolm X, but he saw it and uh, violence doesn't work, um, but serious disruption, you know, stopping, raking the scent trail. It, it's really only the only choice we have at this point. So it's everything that I'm pouring my efforts into is funding disruptive activism, creating disruptive media through our group Yellow Dot, where we openly target anyone from any party, oil CEOs. So 
The pleasure of speaking to you today is that you know this. Um, and what's the takeaway <laughs> from what I said, other than looking at it through a lens that from the superhero movie and man, is you're you're right and don't let anything dissuade you if anything go harder and more passionate because man we do not have much time the truth is we don't know how much time we have we breached 1.5 c the world is now catching up to the amount of co2 that's in the air we don't know how long that's going to take. Why? Because it has never happened in the history of the planet. And these goons, these careerists, these hacks, these shills, these trolls, and they are too busy like rats in an experiment sipping the sugar water uh, to ever take a second. So it is up to us to break that hedonic addiction that they are caught in. Uh, I think I just did the same thing David did where I, <laughs> that, that turned into a rant slash speech. Um, but there's obviously so much to say about this. So let me back off. No, thank you so much. Just like David, I prepared quite a few questions and I keep picking them off because you've already answered so many of them. So I really appreciate it. So um, others in this call might not know, but you've been very vocal in um, public and monetary supporter of projects like ours through the A22 network and the Climate Emergency Fund. So I would love to know um, why you've been so supportive, supportive of projects like ours and why others in this call should also be supportive and participate in direct action. Yeah, so as I just said, I, I had a moment where I really confronted the hard science about where we're at. And that's what led to me kind of throwing every professional favor, chip, credibility into don't look up. And, uh, and really what I've learned through the whole experience is that I, I look, years ago, I used to host the fancy fundraisers. I used to work with the people in DC and I just learned the hard way. They're full of shit. They don't get it. The incentives are too thick. And uh, the human mind is, it, it's too easy to play uh, through positive incentives. And big corporations and billionaires and the oil companies have total control over world governments. Um, so I reached a real moment of despair. And then I was lucky enough to meet Margaret Klein Solomon from Climate Emergency Fund and Roger Hallam from Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil and dozens of other activists who, when I told them about my <laughs> despair, said, Duh. <laughs> and uh, so I've been playing catch up ever since. And our approach is uh, we're giving everything. I mean, I am like, we are giving money, resources, housing. We're selling our house uh, because as I say to other people, I'm like, what are you saving your money for? We're, we don't know. I mean, we're maybe two, five, six years away from civilization collapse. There's a story out today. UK farmers have had crop failures from the extreme rains 
that they haven't seen since World War II. Shoplifters in Spain now target olive oil because the olive crop failed and they actually call it liquid gold. The price of cocoa went, of the cocoa plant went above the price of copper. It's tricky because our news media is just broken. I mean, it's it's almost entirely controlled by big money. So a, a lot of people don't know some of these things. There are indie outlets you can go to. I use social media, but I kind of don't do most of it. I just try and look at climate. But um, when you really get into it, you realize like the time frame we're looking at is like two to four to five years. Like it's pretty small before the window for human action completely closes and we're on a runaway roller coaster. So yeah, I'm all in on activism. It's everything I do. I get called all the time because I'm rich Hollywood guy. And they're like, will you host a fundraiser? I'm like, no. I'm like, have your uh, candidate call me. Or they, do they get climate? And they never call back because there's like six people in Washington, D.C. And believe me, I've talked to all of them that even somewhat get what's going on. And there are some people in D.C. you would hope would get what's going on, and I won't. Oh, screw it. I'll name them. I've talked to Bernie Sanders. I've talked to Sherrod Brown, uh, who you would think are the big left-wing reps. They don't get it. They're too caught in that scent, that ant scent trail in Washington, D.C., and they don't want to hear it. It's up to us, man. We are, there's no one in charge. <laughs> David's right, man. The, the, the boat has no one at the wheel and it's zigging back and forth. Here's the good news. Here's the hopeful part. Look at history. This has happened before that the elites, the people in charge have become so rotten and corrupted that the people have to rise up. And it works. And we are at that moment right now. Yeah, really well said, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, just a little information for those in the call. Adam is a huge supporter of the Climate Emergency Fund, which largely and directly funds groups and civil resistance campaigns within the A22 network, which we are a part of. Uh, other groups such as Just Stop Oil in the UK and Last Generation Germany. So really one of the reasons that we're able to speak with you all today is directly because of amazing donors such as Adam. And when you're talking about fame and access, um, Last Generation Canada and other civil resistance campaigns are made up of ordinary people that have to resort to extreme actions like throwing paint, blocking highways, burning strollers, just to bring attention to the looming wildfire crisis and climate crisis. Um, all the while, some celebrities are garnering headlines for trivial matters like breaking up or getting a new puppy. Uh, but it's the everyday people and the ordinary people that are facing criminal charges and jail time and dedicating their lives for speaking out and telling people to look up. So given um, people with access and influences platform, do you think it's time for those in those positions and that power and privileges, including Hollywood figures such as yourself to recognize the urgency of our cause and get on the front lines with us? It, basically what I'm asking is, is it time for those with access to start filling the prisons? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my friend Roger Hallam just got sentenced to two years of prison in the UK. And uh, he's so 
funny. His response was, whatever. Um, I mean, it's very frustrating out here. There are, in Hollywood, there are a lot of incentives and there's a lot of culture that won't let this moment in. They think I'm a crazy environmentalist. I'm overreacting. What happened to McKay? I mean, you know, before all of this hit me, which really could track back to the big short, you know, I was a guy that made these studios a lot of money. And I always felt like I was doing enough good that it was cool, that the exchange was good. And when I really saw the reality of climate uh, breakdown, I went through three nights where I couldn't sleep. And so to your question, is it time people in Hollywood, rich people, uh, influential people, get to the front lines, I would say that time was probably 10 years ago. So yes, the time is right now. I mean, part of what we have to weigh, and if, if you guys want to say I'm full of it, is I'm trying to do the most effective things from this chair I'm sitting in. Um, but is it possible that's me avoiding the moment handcuffs get put on me and I get put in the LA County lockup? Yeah, it's very possible because I have sent trails. I have ant incentives that as much as I've really tried to account for them, I'm probably bullshitting myself a little bit. So I welcome your feedback. <laughs> if you're like, McKay, it's time to get perp walked and handcuffed. Shit. All right, let's do it. I, I, this is it, man. This is the moment. It's all about how we choose to meet this moment. And I just think the most powerful thing we can do for our own souls for our community, for the people we love, is to make a choice. And nothing upsets me more than all of these people. I don't really blame them. I mean, like David said, it's a screwed up society who aren't making choices, who don't want to know and have already said, like, or, or it, without saying it, have committed to the idea of they're going to wait to the worst effects and they're going to be on the refugee boats or they're going to flee their homes. And that kind of passive consumerist, man, that to me is hell. If you want to use after life uh, frameworks, that to me is hell to, to die like or to suffer or to live, more importantly, to live like cattle in a line uh, waiting to get, you know, killed so they can serve you as a burger. There's no worse thing than that. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you're absolutely right. And a lot of times I think of Don't Look Up uh, it used to be weekly, but I think it's now daily, and I'm constantly wondering uh, uh, where the comet is right now. Um, sometimes I think it's still at that six-month mark, and we just found it. And sometimes I think we're on the Parliament lawns telling each other not to look up. So I want to wrap this up and just ask you um, if you have any last words to uh help people feel better into taking action and just closing remarks yeah the comet has hit uh to be very clear if you look at the earth systems data we have shot past 1.5 
which wasn't really the number, it was more like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 uh, we're seeing, you know, the ice melt is through the roof. I talk to all of these scientists, which my wife keeps telling me, stop doing that because they tell you scary stuff. Uh, the East Antarctic has crossed a tipping point. The Atlantic Current or the AMOC has crossed a tipping point. The Amazon very likely has crossed a tipping point. So the comet has hit. We're out of that phase where we can fix this. But there is still, there are still a lot of things we could be doing. And this is what should motivate all of us. First off, just the awareness, the dignity of people to live in this moment. I, it just breaks my heart, the amount of misinformation, marketing, algorithms that have people lit, like it, it, it really does remind me of the cattle in the assembly line where they think they're going to get feed. It's just no way to live. But the second part, and this really relates to you guys, is like, we can prepare for what's coming. Like was talked about earlier with increased firefighting capabilities, uh, emergency plans for water supply, heat events. And then of course, the big thing always is nationalize the oil companies and shut them down, uh, create an economic plan so you don't send the entire world into chaos, but it should be like a two-year plan where you open national reserves, nationalize the oil companies, uh, create a drawdown plan, use the assets they have towards renewable energy, and most importantly, just get them out of the public space. So our leaders, our news media, our corporate leaders, they need their, you know, sugar water scent trail broken. They need people in their face. They live in a very comfortable bubble. Trust me, I've a little bit been in that bubble. Um, and it's a weird place where I'm not a billionaire, but I've seen people who no one disagrees with them. Everything is accepted. We got to break that. We got to forcibly break that. So there are a lot of things we can do. There is a future. We are not at the point of an extinction event. We are at the point of a very destabilizing, frightening event, but it is not extinction yet. Um, so honestly, my respect for all of you knows no bounds. If you're someone on this call who has money, more money than most people, I, I don't know what you're saving it for. Uh, give it, give it to these passionate, incredible people, because trust me, I've been through every option and like the civil rights movement, like the labor movement, Indian independence, the AIDS activist movement, the only answer right now is a loud, aggressive, disruptive activism. So, yeah. Wow. I really could not have said that better myself. Uh, <laughs> maybe you should start doing this on a weekly basis because uh, Laura and I started this call, but you're making me want to rally, even though I'm already rallying. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's um, time to put our flesh, blood, and bones. The thing is, I, I, I'm trying to find the right time for me to do it. I mean, two people have self-immolated over climate. And you've seen the people that have self-immolated over Gaza, like we're headed towards that level of awareness about how small we are and how we are part of a larger organism. And, uh, you know, the thing I'll call myself out on 
is uh, still that consumer comfort like yeah so i'm with you if anyone needs a place to stay if you're in los angeles doing activism if you need support if you need a lawyer if you want to my group yellow dot to make a video if you want us to send a production crew your way uh we're here we have your back completely this is all I care about, and we love and respect you. Wow. Thank you so much, Adam. The support means more than you could ever know. Um, and you are one of the few people with access and fame that are actually putting everything on the line and helping us before we lose everything we know and love. Um, so thank you so much for that. And Next, I would like to give a very warm welcome to Laura Sullivan from Last Generation Canada, who is going to speak about the amazing sacrifices that she has made to sound the alarm on this climate crisis. She's gonna give us a little bit more information about Last Generation's plan of action and how we are going to win. So take it away, Laura. Wow, Jill. Thank you so much uh, for that really kind introduction. Um, and I really do just have to say, uh, it is quite surreal to be speaking right after Adam McKay and David Suzuki, uh, but we do live in a bit of an absurd world at this moment right now. So I guess all things considered, maybe it makes a bit of sense. Um, and yeah, thank you very, very, very much, Adam, uh, for your support. And thank you, David, for being on this call today and those words and your years of advocacy about this pressing issue. So before I go any further, I do just wanna make the acknowledgement that I am giving this speech uh, from Jok uh, currently known to many as Montreal um, in Canada. It's really important, as Jill said before, to make these acknowledgements, you know, because when we do talk about the wildfires crisis, you know, of those 240,000 people that had to leave their homes last summer, 42% of those people were Indigenous. It's the people who are the most marginalized who are being impacted right now by this crisis. And Adam's right, the comet has hit us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and about the story of last generation and what you can actually do about this. So I'm going to take you back uh, five years ago. It was the spring of 2019. I was studying engineering at the University of British Columbia when I ended up attending this event called Hope in the Climate Crisis. So at this time, I was 20 years old. Um, I was worried about many social issues in Vancouver. You know, I was worried about the housing crisis, the opioid crisis, you know, sexism, homophobia, the, the millions of issues that plague our society. But I had no idea about how bad the climate crisis really was. So David Suzuki was actually speaking at this event, uh, the event called Hope in the Climate Crisis. And when he was asked to speak, he said, I don't know why you asked me to speak at an event called Hope in the Climate Crisis. I don't have hope. If you want things to get better, well, look around you. You're all students here. There's many of you at this event. It's time for you to organize. So. I guess after a while, that's what I did. I took a hard look at the situation. And as we've heard tonight, it's pretty dire. You know, I took a hard look then at the history of civil resistance. And when you really look at what's worked over the past 100 years, it seems to be pretty clear. But most importantly, I took a hard look at myself at the age of 20 years old. And I asked myself, what kind of life did I want to live? What kind of person did I actually want to be? You know, my generation does not have a future. Did I just want to lie down and accept this fate? Do you? So now I've been organizing for about five years in different ways. Um, and I did take a small break at some point. You know, during this break, I was pretty disillusioned about civil resistance in the face of the climate crisis. It can be a bit hard when you're a young person fighting up against this giant machine. 
So during this time, I tried to forget about this crisis. I really tried to look away. Um, I tried to pretend like our resistance had no chance of success. But no matter what I did, I was ridden with a deep anxiety that never went away. And sure, you could attribute this to, you know, how bad I knew that things were going to get. But it was much deeper than that. Deep down, I actually knew there was something that I was capable of, something that we're all capable of. We talk a lot at Last Generation about lies, how our government, our media, the politicians, the diplomats, they've all lied to us time and time again. But I think the most important lie to unpack here is actually something different. It's this lie that you are not powerful enough to change the course here, that you have no other choice but to put your head down, to do your part and recycle and accept the inevitable fate of societal collapse, the inevitable fate of the biggest mass death event that we've ever seen. This lie that you are not powerful is not true. And I am tired of existing in a world that subscribes to this lie. So let's uh, flash forward in my story. It was January of 2023. And you know, I was ready to get back into action. I was ready to do something. Uh, I was waiting around actually to follow someone else's lead. Who was, who was gonna tell me what to do? How can I take action? I was ready to give it all. Um, but you know, it's not like at the time we had to just stop Oil Canada or something going here. Um, there was no one really for me to follow where I was. So then it was March of 2023. And there I was with a thermos of bright pink kids paint at the Royal BC Museum, splashing it onto the tusks of a mammoth. And this made national news and our project was born. It was called Onto Ottawa at the time. And I was absolutely fucking terrified. But then that summer, last summer, we saw the worst wildfire season we've ever seen. You know, and it wasn't just like a little bit worse. It was six times worse the average, you know, 240,000. I've said that number a lot today. Jill said that number a lot today, but 240,000 people kicked out of their homes. This burned 5% of our boreal forest. That forest provides a third of our oxygen in the world. And we lost 5% of it in one summer. Smoke was choking out this country from coast to coast. And yet our government couldn't even respond. The government had 30,000 less wildfire fighters than the terrible 2016 Fort Mac season. 70% of those people are volunteers putting their lives like on the line to protect normal people like us from the impacts of the climate crisis, a situation that most of us didn't create. You know, we're sitting at 1.5 degrees here. You know, this is the beginning of a really, really, really scary future. And our government isn't even able to handle the impacts at this level of warming. Okay, so then the summer ended. And we have this really nice, mild winter, right? Sure, everyone in uh, in the east, in Ontario and Quebec, was delighted that in February it was ten degrees instead of you know negative forty. Um, although that should be terrifying, but maybe it's easy for you to think, okay, well everything's fine right now. You know, the buses are still running. I'm still going to my job. You know, I've still got my husband and my kids at home. Everything's fine, right? Kind of. Well. What's going to happen as this crisis gets exponentially worse and worse and worse when we have burned all of our land, when we cannot grow food, when there are hundreds of millions of climate refugees? What's going to happen when we have twice as many people evacuated from their own homes in our country? You know, this wildfire season is set up to be worse than last year's. These are the conditions that are going to collapse our society. And I think that the word societal collapse is a euphemism for what's coming down the line for us. You know, I used to organize in 2019 
maybe because it seemed like the right thing to do for my kids, for my grandkids, for the next generation, for those living in the global South, right? You know, I'm not going to have kids anymore. You know, I'm organizing this year in 2024 because we don't have a future. I'm organizing in 2024 because I don't want to see my parents get shot at the grocery store, like reaching for the last loaf of bread when we can't grow food here. I don't want to see my younger brother drown in a flash flood. You know, I don't want to see my friends who work up north burn to death. This is the future that we are facing. That's not this forlorn future. It's not 2035. It's not 2030. It's this summer. Young people my age burning to death on the front lines of the climate crisis because our government can't even fund a national firefighting agency. So then ordinary people like us have to devote our lives to taking action. It's completely absurd. So from last year, like I said, I've had no other option but to dedicate my entire life to this work. And since that day in March, I've been arrested three times. I've been held in a remand center in Ottawa. And at one point, you know, the authorities banned me from speaking to the media about this crisis, from speaking or communicating to anyone associated with last generation. So all of my friends or interacting with any form of online content produced by the campaign. So literally just logging on to the last generation website could have landed me back into prison and find $4,000. You know, at one point last year, I was facing five different criminal charges. Forget about my career in engineering. That's just in the past. You know, I moved across the country from BC to Montreal to a place where I didn't know anyone to completely dedicate myself and my life to this work. But I'm not here trying to tell you that I'm some saint or uh, Mother Teresa or something. I'm quite, quite far from that. Uh, because the sacrifices that I've made this pales in comparison to the stakes of the situation. You know, no one cares what happens to some random 25 year old girl, Laura Sullivan, but what matters here is the biggest mass death event that we're looking towards that no one is doing anything about. This is the final moment for humanity, everyone. And yes, I'm doing this because there's a moral imperative, but I'm also doing this because it can work, because we can win. We do not have an option to lose. This campaign, Last Generation Canada, you know, we're not just some hippies holding a sign in the street hoping for the best. We are organized. We work internationally with some of the most successful resistance movements across the world the, within the A22 network. And we're based on data, we're based on research. You know, just like I said, it's not like most people in our classical education systems get a deep dive understanding of the efficacy of civil resistance. It works. That's why most of us have rights today. We're really based off of the work of someone called Erica Chenoweth. She's a political researcher at Harvard, and she's looked into the past 100 years of social uprisings, both violent and nonviolent. And what she found is that nonviolence is over twice as likely to succeed as violence, and that no government can withstand an uprising of just 3.5% of the population. And many, many campaigns have been successful with far less than that. You know, we've seen campaigns throughout history start with very small groups of dedicated, driven people who are willing to put it all on the line you know, and that's why we have rights today. We absolutely can win. So when you see our campaign taking actions that some would call crazy or turning the general public against us, you know, in a world where everyone is sleepwalking towards this mass death event, we're not looking to convince everyone. It's a life or death situation. Our house is on fire and we are pulling the alarm. We are looking to break through the media that won't talk about how bad things are going to get. Yes, it's absurd that we have to do actions like putting paint on a mammoth or a dinosaur or throwing paint 
at a famous painting in a history museum to get the media to notice that there is a climate crisis and notably a wildfires crisis that is set to murder us. You know, and people see our actions and I'm just gonna play around with some numbers here. Let's say 70% of them hate us, you know, And let's say 5% of them, they're going to see this and uh, is my internet connection okay? All good? It's okay? Maybe just re-say that sentence, please, Laura. Yeah, of course. I'll just start from here. No worries. So, you know, and people see our actions and I'm just going to play around a little bit here with some numbers, okay? So let's just say 70% of these people might hate us, right? 25% of them, uh, maybe they understand our point, but they don't like our tactics. Uh, let's just say 5% of them say, this is exactly what we need. But that 5% only heard about us because that 70% of, of them hated us so badly. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking to mobilize those radical people who are willing to do something. And, you know, you don't just get 3.5% of the population in nonviolent resistance from the get-go. We have to inspire with action. And that's why we're iterating this campaign time and time again until we win. We started in August and September with a group of less than 20 people. And our simple, basic, no-brainer demand, a national firefighting agency, was adopted by the NDP and Green Parties of Canada we were able to raise money. We were able to set up chapters in Montreal and Ottawa and keep building. You know, now we have uh, these two teams and we're taking resistance during this phase of recruitment, the CEOs, the politicians, we're disrupting their fundraisers, we're disrupting their events, we're disrupting, you know, their dinner parties. And starting May 20th, we're going back to the Capitol and we will be taking action. And then, we will go out, we will recruit more people, and we will come back into action. And we are going to iterate and iterate and iterate until we win. You know, people always talk to me about the consequences of my actions. Arrest, fines, jail time, the eventuality of a criminal record. But why aren't we talking about the consequences of inaction? The situation in which all of you here today get off the Zoom call and do nothing about the desperate situation that we're in. Last Generation Canada will not stop until we win. This summer, our fires are projected to be worse. Our government has done nothing to address this. The Ontario wildfire fighting budget got caught by a hundred million, like Jill said, since 2022. We have to fight to survive. But we don't win when we get that agency. It's just the first step. It's just that no-brainer demand that can mobilize people to understand the climate crisis, to see the smoke on their doorsteps, for people to be able to reach it. We cannot trust our current pol like political systems. They are broken and they got us into this mess in the first place. And that's why we're demanding legally binding citizens assemblies as a method to deal with this crisis. We need ordinary people, not people who are funded and persuaded by status and the oil and gas industry to make the right decisions for us, just like Adam said. So what we need is citizens assemblies, normal people to make these decisions. So maybe after this call, you'll want to thank me for my passion about the climate crisis, or maybe you're gonna send me a message and tell me that I was an inspiring speaker. But what I prefer for you to do instead is to ask yourself, what are you going to do in this situation? You're not just a viewer, you know. So there's a few ways that you can help us out. So right now we're in the middle of growing our teams and recruiting for actions. If you are currently situated in Montreal or Ottawa, come to our next event in person, meet us and get involved. All this information is on the website. Um, Jill will be posting all of these links. There is so much to do on the ground. And if you're online, we've got lots, lots and lots of tasks for you too. 
you can also take action. We need people to step up and to resist with us. We have training, we have a plan, we have support for you. We can't do this alone. We need you to join us. And like Adam said, you can also donate. If everyone here donated one hour's worth of their monthly wage, this would be amazing for the campaign. Our opponents are well-funded. We are not. This summer is the scariest moment that we've ever seen. And it is our biggest opportunity. This is it. This might be the last moment at which we can see the impacts of the climate crisis coming towards us with just enough time left to mobilize, to do something about this. We cannot afford to lose this. We will continue in resistance until our last breath. Everything depends on this, everyone. Please reflect on what you can give at this time. Thanks very much. And I'm just gonna pass it back to Joe. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, you truly demonstrate the sacrifices that we need to make and must make in face of this crisis. And you are truly embodying it. And you're so right that we all have a privilege and a duty and a responsibility to act. And I thank you so much for your time and also for your sacrifice. And like Laura said, these demands are the necessary first steps to making actual rapid change that we need. History and social science tells us that the fastest way to create transformative change is through disruptive, escalating, nonviolent resistance. Like Laura said, it's clear that we need to use civil resistance to actually make an impact. And it's crucial and our timing is crucial because we all have to decide right now whether we want to be complicit or not. And we all have to act. There is no choice because of what we face is the violation of all of our values and all of our livelihoods. And inaction is the same as action. Before we go into, into breakout rooms and talk about action pathways, I'm asking everyone to join in together uh, in an act of solidarity in response to what we've heard today. Um, for those who have their cameras on, thank you so much. If everyone else wants to, that would be amazing. If not, that's okay too. But um, I'm asking, I give most of my time to Last Generation Canada and I don't need you to panic and sign your life away, but this is all about supporting each other and social solidarity. It's this or we are done. That's what we've been saying. That's what the scientists tell us. So if everyone agrees with what has been said, um, hold up your hand, be proud of it. If you don't have your camera on, you can raise your hand in the Zoom little button too. We are all in this together. It's a practical thing. It's a real thing and we can do this. In times of crisis, we seem extremely alone and we don't know what to do, but look at everyone in this call right now. It's just about all of you. That is so great. So everyone who put their hand up and is terrified of what's coming towards us and terrified of the inaction, you need to ask yourself what sacrifices you can make. Myself and so many people on this call are giving their lives, their money, their time, their 20s, their future towards this project. And to be truthful with people like Adam and people like David and people like Laura, we're all in this together, but we can't do it ourselves. We need a community around us. And we're going to get nowhere if we all don't chip in some way. Many, in this, many people in this call might be dedicating their lives, but we need your help. We can't win alone. So please, 
I sent the donation link in the chat. Uh, even giving one hour of your wage a month will help us to continue to fight and actually sound the alarm on the climate crisis. It's not us versus the rich, it's top versus bottom. It's us versus this extraction-based regime. And we're working together now. We all need to do something together. If you can afford more, we would extremely appreciate it. It's the end of the world. We're giving our lives for this because I want to have children and I want to have grandchildren. I don't want to be the last person in my family that is going to be having a livable future. And this is what acting together looks like. We will have just a short two minute break um, while the donations are made. Thank you all so much. Everything counts. Thank you to the people that are putting their lives and their bodies out for this fight. It's so important. And again, it's the ordinary people that are making a change. You can uh, lower your hands as well if you want to. It doesn't matter so much. I have made breakout rooms for everyone. Um, I'll send the, que the questions in the chat, but we have all spoken so much today and we would love to hear you speak as well. So we will be going into breakout rooms and asking questions. So who are you and how do you feel about what's been said today? A little bit about your journey, uh, questions, concerns. We have facilitators in each breakout chat. And then uh, our facilitators will be telling us the pathways that we can join, whether it be helping with the campaign, donating, coming to a nonviolent direct action. It's been uh, quite the long call. Um, we'll just wait for everyone to return and uh, just wrap things up. So yeah, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Joe. Yeah, I would like to echo Laura. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate everyone for taking the time out of their day to talk about something that's not easy. And I hope everyone had the opportunity to share, listen, and discuss how they feel and what they want their next steps to be. Some of the things that we're asking you to do may seem daunting, but we need to let go of doubt in this time of crisis those fears of what will happen if we do this, to what will happen if we don't do this. And I would like to say thank you so much for listening to me. And before we wrap up, I'm just going to finish the floor by giving Laura time to speak about a fellow activist, Dane Hawk, who is being deported right now for standing up to the climate crisis and taking nonviolent direct action to make a change. Laura. Yeah, so the last thing I'll just say tonight, um, so maybe some of you know, um, and maybe others don't, uh, but unfortunately, a close friend of mine um, and really important uh, activist in the Canadian activism space named Zane Hack, uh, you know, we started organizing around the same time in 2019. And, you know, he was arrested, I believe, 10 times within a year. Uh, taking direct action uh, with respect to the climate crisis. Now he is facing deportation back to Pakistan, which is very, very, very scary. Um, so this is absolutely uh, uncalled for and ridiculous that the government is prioritizing deporting peaceful climate activists instead of, you know, going after the real criminals, the people who are killing us. So if people could please, um, you know, take a look at this website I've just posted here, it's all about the story of Zayn, uh, you know, his dedication to the climate crisis, you know, his real uh, work that he's put in 
And now the consequences that he is facing, standing up to a system that is killing us. So yes, I just linked um, Zane's deportation uh, website right there. And if you can write a letter to your MP about this, um, just like it says too on the website, this could really make the world of difference um, for someone like Zane and his campaign um, and, and his life. Um, he also is married, you know, here, his wife is Canadian. He has every right to be in this country. So please, if you could just take a minute out of your day, the letter is already there. And if you could just send that over to your MP, this would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, Jill, is there anything else or, uh, can we wrap up this call? Okay, thank you everyone so much for joining and we will be in touch. We will be sending uh, some uh, follow-ups. So thank you so much, everyone. Great to meet you all. Bye. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone.